Brad Conrad was to give this talk, uh, who's sitting over here. Brad's been quite sick, so um, I've agreed to step in for Brad, but you know he can help me with the questions. Um, and so I want to switch gears a little bit and now talk about the black carbon issue. And so this will link up in Olga's presentation, we'll follow up for a brief break uh, into some of the Arctic impacts. And so um, in terms of the five themes in FlareNet, essentially what we're trying to do today is touch on three of them, some initial work. This is in the fifth theme, if you were keeping score, but it's on the field measurement side and touches on the fourth theme, which is all about the particulates and what they do. So I mentioned black carbon earlier and that flaring is an important source of this. And so just a reminder, that's the carbonaceous component of soot. And it's got these uh, pretty severe health effects. But as much as anything, we're interested in what, what happens in Arctic environments. What's, what's the potential uh, for climate forcing? And uh, many people here probably know there is extremely limited quantitative data. Uh, why is that? Right now, if you want to follow regulation, how you measure this, people follow in, in Ontario our regulation for plumes is EPA test method 9, same in Alberta. Uh, test method 9 is a visual human observed opacity standard. So basically you have a trained person who's trained to say, eh, 10% gray. Uh, you can have reference charts to hold up and do this called Ringelman charts, uh, but it's an aesthetic standard. That plume looks ugly. I'm going to phone my local politician. We'll send somebody out to observe it and document that it looks ugly. This stands up in court in the US. It's kind of crazy that in 2017 we do this. There is now a digital camera based version of this, but it, again, it's just aesthetics. And the nature of light scattering and optics is that you know, the same emission can look quite different under different lighting conditions. We've all probably had that experience. So really, this is where we're starting from. So there is a path forward, uh, and it's kind of one of the early uh, bits of research that led to the kind of core group of expertise that formed FlareNet, where we're trying to link these controlled experiments in the lab with field measurements. And so over the past few years, we've been developing a new technology called Skylosa. It's an optical measurement technology. Uh, and we've, uh, well, Brad's participated, Melina's participated in some. We've now achieved some of the first field measurements ever of black carbon from flares, and I'm going to share those with you now. So what is this? It's SkyLosa. It's an acronym for Line of Sight Attenuation of Skylight. Um, and what this means is we can go out in the field now and measure what are the emission rates in this black plume, quantitatively in, say, grams per second with some kind of uncertainty. And so this is a patent bending technology. It was developed at Carleton University in collaboration with National Research Council with uh, strong support from Natural Resor Resources Canada. And the World Bank has uh, helped us do some of the first demonstrations all outside the country. Okay, a bit of math, but uh, not to be scared at all by this. Uh, what this is to say is that there's a lot going on when you think about how sunlight and skylight all can reflect and get absorbed by that plume and affect what you might see with your eyes. So when you think of the human observer, the eye is a terrible instrument. It's uh, logarithmic, if you want to get technical about it. it means the fact that I can look at you, and then look at this bright screen, and then look back at you and see you is actually a bit of an evolutionary miracle. It also means it's a really lousy instrument for quantifying gray, because the saying, we've, what's the, the blue dress, the blue and gold dress? Yeah, yeah we all know. Um, so what we've done is we've figured out a mathematical basis to correct for these effects. And essentially all this is is, there's a bunch of junk there, and yeah, each one of those is its own kind of long integral equation for the mathematicians in the room, uh, but that is something about how much skylight gets blocked. And we roll all that, something about how much the plume is moving, and we add in some of the optical properties that uh, we're trying to measure in, in, in the lab this week, put those all together, and we get a mass emission rate of soot. And so this started actually as a concept in 2005, fun story, of Tim Horton's commercial with a cup of coffee even. Um, five years later, as these things kind of go, there was a first proof of concept. We actually got a bit lucky working with the World Bank and a field measurement in Uzbekistan around 2011. Another two years to really figure out what we were doing because we realized then we didn't quite have it right. And then four years later, just out in February, is the first actual quantitative measurement that we're going to talk about now. Um, 
And you can see how this goes. That's a former student of mine, Chen Yang, who's very shy. She wouldn't let me take her picture. She's hiding her face. Uh, but she did really great work. Seriously, she just so could never get her to take a picture. Uh, but we used to push this you know, crazy apparatus outside in the lab, try to make these ridiculous measurements. Uh, anytime we showed this to somebody in industry, they thought we were crazy. You know, that's never going to work. And they were right. And it, but, but eventually it did. So kind of fun. Um, and so working with uh, World Bank and Petro Amazonas uh, and Pemex as well, um, we made measurements uh, over a couple of years in Veracruz, Mexico region and Ecuador um, near Coca uh, in the jungle. It was really kind of fun. Um, and so what do we do in the field? We, uh, to get quantitative data, we're trying to measure what's going up the flare. So we need to know flow rates. We need to know composition of the gas going up the flare. And then we know how to try to measure the emission rate. And we can get all those three pieces together. We can actually say something that is applicable around the world. And so we have this optical probe. We can slide into flares if we do this just right. We have another technique where we can inject a tracer. And then a little further down in a pipeline, we can measure the concentration. Uh, various ways, all kind of slightly modified so we can do this portably you know, in the jungle. Uh, you take gas samples. Uh, Brad became a dangerous good shipper, officially certified, just so we could figure out how to get this stuff across borders. Um, took, a, took a couple tries, but we've eventually done it. Um, and then you take this kind of 50 pound uh, workstation class server computer in a box, um, you know, with another $9,000 disk array inside, and you collect, you know, terabytes of data very quite fast. And then you come back and, well, I, I wrote the first really bad code once many years ago, and then Brad took it over. And so I just say, Brad, go figure it out. And four months later, he's got an answer. It's quite computationally intensive. What does that look like? So here's a flare um, from this Ecuador measurement campaign. And you can see it's really quite challenging conditions. Uh, you certainly, you can see the black carbon by eye, but no sense of what's there. And you're looking at this crazy cloud background. And so uh, there are a number of really interesting parts to this. Uh, this is a conference paper uh, that Brad's the lead author on. Uh, hopefully, we'll turn into something more at some point soon. But um, how could you even possibly interpret that? This is my fun little CSI animation. So you, this is real, this isn't CSI. You've seen these things on TV, you know, enhance that. This actually works. So in this case, you can actually uh, map the motion of the clouds in the sky. So those you can't see from where you are perhaps, but these are little arrows tracking the motion of individual sky regions. And so that means that when we're trying to figure out what the sky looks like behind that plume, we can propagate the clouds behind and effectively erase the the clouds, and that's that's not image processed in any sense. That's actually real. Now, it doesn't always work so beautifully. There are cer certainly still circumstances we have trouble dealing with, and this is really truthfully an ongoing research exercise on the technology itself. One of the things we're trying to deliver in FlareNet is measurement technologies. Nevertheless, um, when you come back and do all the processing, you can end up someplace like this. So, what is this? Starting in the upper left, you're looking at that same flare. And the red arc that's been drawn, you can think of as an optical net. And so as the plume crosses that red line, we're measuring everything passing through. Uh, so as if it were an optical net. And so here, it's kind of an inter intermediate calculation step. It, these are all synchronized. So as that big puff comes through, these things dip down a little lower. Let me run that again. Um, you can see it's also moving along the arc, wherever the plume is as that moves along the arc. So that's essentially measuring how much skylight is getting blocked, more or less. Not shown here, we're also tracking the motion of the plume in detail. And you put that all together, you can figure out what the mass is crossing. So, you know, that big kind of puff came through. Um, let me back up one more time. Now, you see, watch this time, you'll see the big puff as the big puff comes and sets up. So on the vertical axis there, that's the emission rate, grams per second. So the little blue dots here are what we think the number is. There's the big burst. Here's the second phase of that big burst. Um, the gray band around that is the actual uncertainty. That's what makes this really unique, is it's not enough to say this is 3 grams a second or whatever it is. It's 3 grams a second minus 25 to plus 35 percent is kind of the accuracy, which if you think about comparing that to somebody's eyeball, it's actually pretty good. This is something we can actually use. So we were quite excited by this. 
And so, again, the World Bank has been really good uh, to work with. They're really, really highly motivated to try to uh, influence development flaring around the world. So we've made a number of measurements now. This is the entirety of, <laughs> it's kind of sad, but this is every measurement there is for a flare in the world right now, uh, at least for black carbon emissions, every direct measurement. Um, and for me really paying attention, on the vertical axis there, that's a log scale. So every time I go up, it's a factor of 10. It's 10 times more than the last. So there's a factor of 10,000 variation among those 14 flares. This is a big problem uh, in terms of if I were a regulator and I see that, I say, you know, go home, go back to the lab. I don't want to deal with this. This is a big headache. And factor of 10,000 from site to site, how do you handle that? And you think you've got a handle on that. Maybe we've got it constrained, and then you walk into something like this. This is a flare we stumbled on in Mexico. I'll say that. Why not? Um, at a Pemex facility. Um, that's a large pit flare. Uh, what you probably can't tell is the sun is there. If you look at the sky, the gradient in the sky, you can kind of maybe believe me that that's where the sun is. Uh, you know you're desperate to try to make a measurement. When you see this, you take your $50,000 camera and you point it directly at the sun, uh, but you detect no signal because it's 100% blocked. Um, people talk about sky filling with smoke. I've never seen anything like this up close. It's actually kind of frightening. I, I won't play the audio on this video, but it's because this, <laughs> this wasn't quite... Uh, it was more innocuous, and then the event happened, which anecdotally we've heard is a monthly event as they change a the process in the plant. So we were fairly close when this started. And so, yeah, I can't play the audio because you can imagine what the audio is like. <laughs> yeah, retreat. Um, except I didn't say retreat. Um, so this is a still image of that. Again, the sun's hiding behind there. So we couldn't measure this. We came back the next day, though, and so uh, as you can see, we made three successive measurements as this event was ending 24 hours later. And so those, if you see the arrows, are aligning with the top three measurements we've got on our graph. And so many people here might be familiar with the concept of outliers or super emitters. That's an interesting problem for oil and gas sources. What is that? That's one source that is so much bigger than all the others that it overwhelms them. And this is a great problem for regulations, inventories, we had methane regulations announcements uh, yesterday. You know, an individual pneumatic controller may not leak one, not that much. One out of every 20 or so probably leaks 100 times the average. And so you, you really now are trying to develop policies to go find these things and stop these outlier events. Not an easy statistics problem. So I don't know what that is, but I know what these things are as it's ending, and they're already pretty scary. Okay, context. Um, numbers in the graph don't mean much. Let's put it in some units we can all relate to. So here's the first measurement we ever published. Uh, it's in Uzbekistan, of all places. That's another story for another time. But um, in the publication, we try to put this in some human context and said, if you look at what a typical bus on the road emits, not a new clean bus, uh, but an actual uh, dirty one, um, then that, was, that one flare was about 500 buses. Um, and so you say, think about the policy implications, the economics of all this. I can go try to remove or electrify Ottawa's bus fleet. Uh, I don't know what that would cost if it was even possible. Or I can go to you know, the Toronto Transit System and try to retrofit every single vehicle in there and make a 10% improvement equivalent to 500 buses off the road. I'm not even sure that would do it. Or maybe we could do something about that one flare. Uh, and so here is where the silver lining in all of this is, is the opportunity space. Point of variability, there's the flare in Mexico, 17 buses. Uh, you can occasionally find a clean one. That's only one bus. There's one about 569 buses. And this one, I don't know, 14,000 plus on the measurement we were able to make. Who knows what it really was? Uh, so interesting challenges. The news isn't all bad, though. And this is where I'm finally going to tie this to the Arctic. Um, if we try to take a pragmatic approach to this and say, how can we model these emissions so somebody can use this? So we say that, well, soot emissions, black carbon emissions, largely are dependent on the energy content of the fuel. We call it the heating value. So if I take the only four measurements we have in the world where we actually have the emission rate and the fuel composition and the fuel flow rate all together, 
I'll add in a little bit of lab data we had just at the start of FlareNet. Uh, we are working now quite feverishly to extend that out under a much broader range of conditions. And I'll fit a line to that. It's not perfect. It's not you know, the most accurate, perhaps. But this gives us a model we can use. So now I can potentially predict what a flare might emit under different conditions around the world. And of course, this all works because flare emissions are incredibly strongly correlated with composition. So I'll talk about this in a second. In here is also an opportunity. We want to get rid of this black carbon. Well, you have disproportionately high black carbon when you have high energy content. High energy content means typically high liquids content. Liquids are something that's valuable. You can condense pentanes and butanes and hexanes out of flare gas relatively easily. You can transport them. You don't need pipelines. And they are typically more valuable than oil itself. Um, in Canada, they're called diluent, pentane. Um, it enables oil sands production. So if you come back to the flaring, uh, the Arctic impacts in flaring. So I showed you this earlier, and Olga will pick up on this uh, momentarily. Black carbon will increase uh, absorption of light on snow. And this kind of seminal, or give you famous paper by Andreas Stoll in 2013 made this assertion that flaring could be as much as 42%. What The black we see on snow, 42% of that came from flaring, potentially. But that's all based on models, transport models over the Arctic uh, that are validated with the kinds of data that Olga collects uh, using emission factors that we're trying to develop. And there's a huge amount of uncertainty in all of that. So if I come back to this graph, and you look at the model that they used to make that very important international conclusion, is something um, the clips uh, from gains, it's a global inventory essentially. And essentially they took a single number and they kind of roughly attribute it back to some old lab data of ours, some measurements by CAP and something from EPA. And it doesn't agree with any of those sources, it's just kind of a ballpark estimate. If we now take our very crude model, I fully admit we only have four data points for the world really here, and we say, okay, what's a realistic heating value for the world? It's somewhere in that blue range is our best guess, which means that the actual emissions are probably 40 to 100% factor of two higher than what they used, and that really startlingly scary conclusion that 42% of what you find in the snow is from flaring. Uh, that could be underestimated at 40 to 100%. It's where we sit now. I don't know if that's true. I think it's largely true, or circumstantial evidence is quite strong. Uh, our quantification is still a great degree of uncertainty. The models have a great degree of uncertainty, but this is really quite frightening for the Arctic, given how much of flaring is um, skewed, skewed towards northern latitudes, how much flaring occurs in um, northern Russia, for example. One last bit of silver linings from some colleagues who work for Highbond Engineering, uh, a project that was done in Libya a number of years ago, before people even started talking about black carbon. Uh, where they took those two flares on the left, installed a liquid recovery system on one of them, and took reduced it to this. They couldn't care less about the environment. Maybe that's a little unfair, but that was the, their motivation was purely economic. They went to make a few million dollars working with the government of the day and implement this project. I find this to be a good silver lining for this in that there are economically viable things that are, you know, economics is essential to any successful regulation. Um, to, to mitigate some of these sources. And so if, as we build techniques that help measure, help quantify, help people build a business case, then we can also build ways to, to develop regulations that might influence some of this, because it's really emerging as a frighteningly important problem. So with that, um, I can say that measurements of black carbon are now possible, which is, which is new and kind of exciting, and that black carbon adds significantly to the urgency in reducing flaring globally. And I think uh, Olga will talk more about that. Often, when you see black carbon, it does represent an opportunity. I think it's an important message to try to tell to people in the industry, especially. And this new NCERT FlareNet initiative is hopefully providing that broad underlying support for mitigation acts and actions and evidence-based policy. And I really need to acknowledge, I hope Francisco is on the line, uh, World Bank for their support. Um, and we're working with them. Uh, I have had a chance to talk much about that today in support of their zero routine flaring initiative, um, doing economic analysis and trying to remove barriers to making that happen. 
I was just in Paris two weeks ago on meetings about that. So I will happily take any questions. Then I think we'll take a quick break, and then uh, we'll have our feature presentation by Dr. Bovacheva. Yeah, please. Thank you. All right. Um, question in terms of so the heating value correlates well with the emissions. Are there other more uh, variables that would be more likely to think about, like the efficiency of the combustion? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, heating value actually only works because heating value for a narrow range of fuels tends to scale with how much carbon is in that fuel. So if you've got like a methane, ethane, butane, uh, C1, C2, C3, you know, the, the heating value is all scale 1, 2, 3. Uh, and so heating value is a really nice measure because it's something industry has. They know that data. It's, it's accessible. It's achievable. From, from a science perspective, which is a really good question, I think there's other things you might choose that would model the problem, a science problem a bit better. How many double bonded chemicals are in there versus triple bonds versus single bonds? What's the carbon to hydrogen ratio of the fuel? Uh, and then there's the other things about um, which we've left out of this entirely at this stage, but we know matter, the, the size of the flame. How much residence time do you have? Do you have a great big billowing Kuwait oil fire? Or do you have a little tiny you know, jet flame like in your barbecue? Uh, and so there are a number of other factors you can bring in. Um, I think what, uh, to, to take too long to answer, if our goal in the lab will probably be to try to uh, pragmatically approach, take both of these routes. So let's see if we can get as detailed an understanding as we can, and then try to find what's the simplest representation we can get out of that that's still useful. And so something like a heating value, that's where we're starting. Because you know, there's a practical limit to what you can put in a regulation or, yeah. So it's a great question. Yeah. Uh, my question, in fact, is three parts, or uh, raises three questions. Uh, the question is that you're talking about the polluting uh, of the permafrost by soot, by the yeah, soot carbon, uh, which causes to lose the, its uh, reflectivity power and increases the absorptivity. Now, as we know, in theory, the reflectivity of snow is close to 1. Practically, it is 0.9 something. Now, with this pollutant, is there any measurement, that's the first question, any measurements to say what is the range of the decrease in reflectivity of the snow or permafrost? It's less than 0.9. How much? Is it significant or not? The second question is that this polluted area of the permafrost how serious is it as serious it is actually right now and with what rate is increasing? The question three is that most of these flares we see here uh, exist in most of the uh, oil fields or any factories which uh, uses gas as the uh, fuel and it uh, brings lots of sour gas as you know, there was a big debate between Canada and U.S. with regard to acid rain because of the acidic nature of these gases. So there was initiative to put cap on top of the uh, these flares to cover, to absorb the uh, acidic part of the uh, exhaust. Is there, the question three is here, is there any measures taken in order to absorb the soot uh, coming out of this flare gas or not? So there's three Question. The question one, the significance of the reflect, uh, reducing the doctrine absor reflectivity. Two, what's the rate of the increasing of the permafrost? Three, is there any measurement or initiative has been taken to absorb the suits? Ah, thank you. Good questions. And uh, thanks for the summary at the end, because you're testing my memory to hold three <laughs> questions in my head. So on the first question, uh, it really depends on the coverage. So. Black carbon, we call it black carbon, it's, it's uh, what you call the scattering to absorption ratio of the kinds of particles. We're actually measuring this for the first time this week in a lab. It's never really been measured before, but it's, it's, it's black. It's 97% uh, light absorbing, maybe 3%. So 97% is black carbon, 3% is organic carbon. The organic carbon tends to scatter. Um, the uh, scattering to absorption ratios are in and around 0 0.1, 0 0.15. So the carbon itself is black. So when you lay it down on the snow, it depends on the coverage. 
um, you know, you know, as you accumulate more and more and more, your surface gets blacker and blacker and blacker. I don't know off the top of my head, maybe Brad's seen data, I would think you could easily take uh, the reflectivity down to 15% on a, on a well-covered uh, bit of snow just based on the optical properties. You want to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And so, so you know, if you take it from effectively 100% down to 15%, reflect, it's a fundamental change. And, and, and that's why everybody can see this in the spring. You watch a dirty snowbank in the spring and it gets all kind of full of holes. Those are particles that have absorbed sunlight, warmed up, and melted down into the snow. That's why it gets like that. So it's, it's, it's easy to see this effect and it's quite strong. In terms of question two, uh, what's the rate of change? Um, I'm actually not the best person to answer that. I think Olga might have comments on that. Um, there are, she's been working with others on sampling efforts in the Arctic that she's going to talk about momentarily uh, on kind of a cruise ship wouldn't do it justice, a scientific vessel um, uh, collecting samples, uh, first trying to figure out where the transport's coming from and, and what's the change. I don't, I know that um, kind of current studies would say that of what you find in the snow, maybe 42% of that is from flaring with, a, I think, a fair degree of uncertainty. Um, what's the rate of change? I'm not sure, to be fair. Um, oh, I made it through two. Third question. Sorry. What was the third question again? Oh, uh, treatment. Post. Yes. Yeah. So in terms of once the, you can see what, well, there's ones in the background here. You, like there's just no, there's, once you've flared and you have this open turbulent flame in the atmosphere and you're producing that plume, there's really no way of getting the cat back in the bag. Um, you know, Pandora's box has been opened, it's out there. And so the kinds of treatments you can do have to happen before. And so there are things like um, liquid knockout systems, condenser systems, where you, in particular you can condense out the liquid components of the fuel. And those images I showed you from um, Libya, uh, that's essentially, that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, I've talked to the, uh, Larry Richards, was a person who did this. Uh, yeah, well, he was from High Bond Engineering. He's gone on to another company now. He, he told me that you know, the only reason this still has anything left is because there was one flare line that they determined was too inconvenient to bother tying in. Their goal wasn't anything to do with environment. It was just making money. Um, but these sorts of things are, in a lot of situations, economic, uh, just because of the value of the condensable. So there are pretreatments you can do, uh, and those happen. Um, for flares, you can, you can do desulfurization uh, processes. That's not necessarily commonly done if you're just going to flare the gas in the current regulations, but yeah, yeah. So there are, there are things to do. It's just whether or, not, whether or not you can build the business case f to support a regulation. In the States, you all kind of watch this, uh, you put forward a regulation, and then there's a planned period for lawsuits. And the regulation that survives, emerges at the end, is the one that survived the lawsuit process. It's just how the system works. And it's important for scientists to understand that, that if we want to influence this, we need to give some regulator the evidence that says that flare is costing X dollars, is killing so many people, is some kind of study, economic measure, some basis. Similarly, we have to say the way to turn that into that is to take the dew point down to three degrees or two degrees or whatever. The more evidence we can give, the stronger policies we can have. And that's really one of the motivations for this network. So, yeah, I really thank you for the questions. Yeah. yeah. So in order to get to your point, yes, you need to, I guess, are you going to plan to work on from source to receptor site kind of impacts in order to then identify really what the uh, impacts are on different locales? So, so currently within the network, what we're really trying to focus on is the source, source emission rates and whatever we can do at the source to influence or reduce or avoid emissions, especially in the hydraulic fracturing part of that. And our sincere hope with that is that all the scary stuff Melina was talking about is that we can identify maybe changes that we can do or things that we can base regulation around, filtration limits if that's what it is. Um, to avoid things. So that's really the focus. Uh, and then in the field, it's about measurement techniques to measure again and, and validate. We're currently stopping short of and saying what the fate in transport and where those go. 
I, mean, I guess it's a philosophical idea of let's figure out what we have and then figure out how much we can reduce it. But but that's not the that's a vital part of it, it's just a little bit out of our domain. That said, uh, Olga will talk about the transport in particular in the Arctic, uh, where she's actually primarily working the, at the backside at the, measuring the receptor and trying to apportion back and figure out where it came from. Uh, and then within that, there's all kinds of opportunities. Alberta Energy Regulator and Alberta Health um, have kind of paid attention to the work that Molinas just talked about. Um, I don't think I'm saying anything out of turn here. I think they're they're quite concerned, um, which is an interesting change of tone, different governments and whatever. And so they're looking at launching a, a health study um, that we may advise on. We're a little bit reluctant to take on too much more. <laughs> um, but yeah, really good question. Hi. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I guess I was interested in those outlier events. Yeah. So, I mean, I understand that, okay, so you could put various mechanisms in place uh, you know, to help prevent those, but I'm just wondering to what extent are they actually unpredictable? You know what I mean? like, this, this is the, the million dollar, billion dollar question in, in regulatory policy for the oil and gas industry. And so for sources like methane, I think we have better data on it. We have many, many small sources, potentially, all these pneumatics. People have started doing surveys and they can build up statistical, data is still pretty rough, but statistical measures. And then we can, uh, we've done some of this ourselves. we're just a little late in the publication, uh, fly planes over regions of the province and measure from the sky and try to put those two pieces together. Uh, work I haven't had a chance to talk about today at all, but so there you can start to get an idea maybe of the occurrence rate, although I think that's still very debatable uh, what that is. Unfortunately for these black carbon events, they're so the data are so sparse. I mean, I've basically shown you all the quantitative measurements in the world. There's a few airplane studies on top of that. Um, I, I would say somewhat controversial in their methodology, or at least we think they're controversial. Um, and so I don't, I don't think we have a handle on that. That event that we happened to capture in Mexico we were told that was a month, uh, one one day a month, you know, kind of 12 months a year. And I know from other channels that that particular facility, it's, it's near near a town of Quetzalcoatlcos, uh, but not the best in Spanish, but I think that's close, uh, near Manatitlan also. Um, and they have a number of local air quality concerns. It's quite a political uh, issue in that town. So, but yeah, if we could figure out some way I suppose the other way to get at this is with NOAA, um, the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration. There we go. Uh, Chris Elvidge is the person there who uh, runs the visual VIRS satellite, it's called, to do the, some of the satellite pictures I showed. And so we've chatted with him a couple times recently. Again, just not sure we can take on too much more work, but they're, they're trying to do this, these, uh, their new satellite basically, trying to measure, uh, they can only see on clear days, but they look at the statistics of when they detect events, so they can get some large events for flaring, but again, it's not really black carbon yet, so I've sidestepped that question, basically. Uh, I don't know. I, I wish we knew, because that changes everything, whatever that outlier is. Yeah. Jim. I have two questions related, so I'll ask them. Perfect. This, this flare here is in near the equator, uh, and you said that the uh, black carbon lifespan is about one to three weeks. So, how will this affect the Arctic? Ah, it's a good question. That particular flare, I mean, again, transport models are quite complex. One to three weeks is, you know, rough ballpark. That's in Libya. I don't know when it's going to rain next, which is the primary removal ne mechanism. And so, you know, how far can it get? And how high? How high can it rise? Before it gets rained out, and you know, does it? Can it? How far can it be transported? Um, sometimes remarkably long distances, but I think the truth is, yeah. In Ecuador, for example, whatever we're measuring there is not making it to the Arctic. I think that's probably fairly certain. And this is really one of the problems with uh, climate uh, policy understanding: is what? How do you handle black carbon? There's one unit of black carbon in Ecuador is probably not nearly as uh, bad for global warming is one unit in Cantimansisk, 
and Russia. Um, and so, yeah, that, that flare, maybe not the one in Libya, but certainly in Ecuador is arguably never, none of that's making it all the way up. It doesn't mean it's not having effects. It, it is, absolutely. It, just in the air alone, it's such a strong optical absorber, it has a direct warming effect. Uh, and that's clear some, in aggregate across the whole planet. People say that black carbon is um, second only to CO2 in climate forcing potential. But the air bars are large. In fact, the air bars are so large, if you take the extreme of the air bar, it's even more important than CO2 in the AR5 IPCC assessment. The air bars also go quite low, so we don't really know. But that is Second question. Going back to that graph you have, the black carbon versus the higher heating value. Now, you obviously know that Petronex, uh, they report production data, they report volume of gas being flared. And we do know the higher heating value, but we can estimate the higher heating value of that gas. So we, from that graph, can infer how many kilograms or even tons of black carbon. Yeah. Is that a meaningful? I think it's the best we could do today. Uh, in fact, I think it's a great idea. So this is in, this is on our to-do list. So we've mapped the Petro, Petronex is the uh, industry reporting system for the Alberta government, run by the well, actually now it's with Saskatchewan and soon to be BC. Yeah, um, and so industry, whatever they're required to report, limited as it may be, in terms of flaring and venting volumes, goes into Petronex. So we've got. Uh, kind of the, the 2016, well, continue, as you know, data. Um, and recently we've mapped the composition of every individual facility, every individual well, actually, in the province of Alberta, back in time. And then by how much it's reporting production, we've uh, production weighted that back to batteries so we can get, we have estimates of the composition at every individual battery now. Um, we've been doing that because we're trying to do these methane calculations. So you fly it anyway. Um, but we could also do that. To just tack this on also. Definitely. And, and uh, I should say that. Um, uh, mostly I was focusing on the international aspect for the here. There's a line I could draw on for what the uh, national pollutant release inventory emission factor is. And, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous in itself. It's based on something from the EPA, from a landfill gas flare from way back that's got n nothing to do with, you know, apples and oranges, uh, apples and elephants. Um, and they took the heating value of 15 for landfill gas, and they just multiplied by 3 to get a rough number for uh, flare gas in Alberta. And they said, okay, we'll give you this number, and I think it's 2.5632 kilograms per cubic meter, which is kind of comical in itself. You know, they assume they have five digits of precision. Every flare in their world is the same amount. Um, that number, well, you can see 2.5632, you know, sits somewhere up here. Um, I think that's the right units, yeah. Um, and if you think about heating values in Alberta, they actually tend to be on the lighter side, um, you know, 49 and down. Uh, actually in and around those red dots. And so if anything, uh, here's a good news story, probably in Alberta, uh, what's being reported at the National Pollutant Release Inventory for Black Carbon may be overestimated. Uh, so this is the one hook we have with industry to try to get site access in Canada. You kind of notice the politics of this all. Most of our measurements have been outside the country. Um, however, internationally and globally, uh, especially as you get regions that aren't Alberta has a really well-developed pipeline infrastructure, so most gas gets captured in the pipelines, I mean, truthfully. I mean, it's still a remarkably frightening, yeah, exactly, frightening component that isn't, but compared to other parts of the world. Uh, so in other parts of the world where they don't have this infrastructure, they're burning kind of heavier gas that here we would consider too economic or too valuable. And so uh, Olga and I were chatting with this. Brad and I have tried to look. There's so limited data to figure what's going on in the world, but you know, in this region is a good guess for a global average, which is, then, then that gets scary. That's quite a bit above what the climate, climate community thinks currently. So yeah. How about some coffee? <laughs> Let me take a five minutes and then I'll let Olga get ready. And um, I promise you her presentation will be the best. She's got great pictures. Thank you.